Thank you. How are you doing today? Well, good. As Bill was saying, my name is Russ Miller, and we have a ministry we call Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. We came up with this name because, well, sometimes we talk about creation and biblical accounts, and other times we talk about Darwinism and evolutionary accounts. But we always try to tie these two philosophies, and they're both religious beliefs, into the scientific evidence. I mean, think about it. Aren't creation and evolution the same thing? There's their accounts on how we got here. Yet today our kids are being taught that one is science and the other is religious. Now, I'm here to tell you they're not science, they're both beliefs. But if one of them is true and one of them is true, you can take the scientific things that you can test, study, and observe and compare them to the biblical accounts and to the evolutionary accounts and one of them is going to come out on top every time. The other one never hardly adds up at all. And yet it's taught as science in the textbooks. They're both philosophies on how we came about. Jesus said, if I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Jesus is saying if, if he has told us of things that we can actually test, study, and observe, hold in our hands, and we won't even believe those things, how are we going to believe if he tells us of spiritual and heavenly things? How indeed. For the past 195 years, a key question has been, how old is the earth? Did you know that 200 years ago, almost everyone believed the earth was a few thousand years old? So how old is the earth? It's a key question today. The Bible says, he that answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame to him. In other words, let's open up our minds and let's look at what the facts have to say. Jesus also said that Moses wrote of me. And Moses gives us the biblical worldview in the book of Genesis. It basically states that God recently created a perfect universe and a six-day creation. There was no death, evil, or suffering in this creation. But then it was man's original sin that separated us from our loving creator. In fact, it was that separation that required us to be redeemed, reunited with that Creator. And that Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on a cross, His shed blood covering our sins if we believe in Him and accept Him as our Lord and Savior. The Bible also tells us that it was original sin that allowed death and evil to enter God's perfect creation. You know, if you know someone who lost a loved one in an accident, and they say to you, how could a loving God allow this to take place? Well, you need to bring them back to the book of Genesis and explain how it was man's sin that allowed death and suffering into God's world, but how Jesus died on a cross and how Jesus in the near future is going to give us a new heavens and new earth. Well, once again, there'll be no more death, evil, or suffering where the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the lion will eat straw like an ox. But if you've compromised the book of Genesis, you can't biblically answer that individual. Now, Moses also told us that there was a global flood I've got to tell you, if there had been a global flood, the evidence would be overwhelming. I mean, the outer crust of the earth would be made up of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water full of billions of things that died in the flood. Did you know the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water? And they're full of billions of dead things that we call fossils? <laughs> exactly what would be there had there been a global flood. In fact, Grand Canyon is a monument to God's global flood judgment. Jesus also said that if you believe not Moses' writings, how shall you believe my words? Why is it important to believe Moses in order to believe Jesus? Well, you see, in the schools for the last 40 years, they've been teaching the secular worldview, which is based on the exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water. But they say, wait a minute, kids, those layers of rock laid down by water didn't form in a flood. No, they form slowly over millions and billions of years, but they're full of dead things. That means death and suffering brought man into the world. The message of the Bible is man's sin brought death into the world. All millions of years' beliefs say that death brought man into the world. And I want you all to realize that until I learned this information, going back about eight years ago, I was a theistic evolutionist. I was a trustee in my church, but I thought God used evolution and billions of years of death to get us here. And then I learned this information that I now share with others. And I'm not here to attack anyone that believes in theistic evolution or progressive creation or any of those beliefs trying to fit millions of years into God's word. 
I'm here to help those folks just like somebody helped me. If you're really seeking the truth. Because death before sins means there was no creator. There was no original sin separating you from that creator. And then there's no reason to be reunited with that creator. There's no reason for Jesus to sacrifice. And that's what evolution and millions of years philosophies are really about, are really all about. Even though most people in the church that believe in millions of years do not realize this. This is the editor of American Atheist. He understands the issues. He says, if there was never an original sin, there is no need of salvation. And that puts Jesus into the ranks of the unemployed. And I agree with that statement 100%. If, if the Bible's not true, we don't need to mix secular atheist philosophies into it. We can just get rid of it. But I'm here to tell you the Bible is true. Word for word and cover to cover in the church as a whole needs to start standing up for that and stop compromising because it's destroying the faith. Now, there are many good and godly teachers in our public school system, so don't misunderstand me. But it's the textbooks. They're teaching out of the humanistic textbooks, and we're now in our fourth generation being taught these anti-biblical facts. No wonder Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceives you. Now, I'm going to try to brainwash everybody. Is that okay? It'll only take a minute. And then I'm going to unbrainwash you. But I want to make a point with this, so if you know the answer, don't say it out loud. I want you to think about what you would do if you were in this person's position. A man left home jogging. He jogged for a little ways and he turned left and jogged a little further, turned left, jogged further, turned left, and jogged back toward home. But as he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men ahead waiting for him. What should the jogger do? Should he turn and run the other way, yell for help, dial 911? What would you do? Now, let me unbrainwash you. But I want you to realize something. If your first thought is wrong, your following thoughts are way off base, and you've been brainwashed. A man left home jogging. He jogged for a little ways, and he turned left. And he jogged a little ways further and turned left, jogged further, turned left, and jogged back toward home. But as he was jogging home, he noticed there were two masked men ahead waiting for him. Catcher in the umpire. What should he do? Slide, right? Absolutely. Well, here's the problem. If your first thought was wrong, your following thoughts are way out in left field. You have been brainwashed. And the simple fact of the matter is, we can tell six-year-olds anything, and they're going to believe us, as they should be able to. And for the last hundred-plus years, we've been telling six-year-olds that over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved out Grand Canyon. Let me ask you a question. Who saw that take place? Nobody. That's a belief. That's not a fact. Jesus said you tell good from bad by the fruits they produce. Well, the fruits of billions of years are billions of people rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You ever hear of Charles Templeton? He was a contemporary of, uh, of uh, Billy Graham. They started out at the same time, and Charles Templeton was more popular than Billy Graham. He had his own television show every week called Look Up and Live. And then Charles Templeton became convinced the world was millions and billions of years old, and lost his faith and became an outspoken atheist. You tell good from bad by the fruit. No wonder the Bible says, teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Did you know the Bible says, don't give heed to endless genealogies, which minister to questions rather than godly edifying? Did you know studies today say half of Christians believe in millions of years? either progressive creation, theistic evolution. And once again, I'm not here to attack anyone that believes that. I'm here to help you. Because so we're going to take out one of the icons of millions of years right now. Because the Bible says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So let's take a look at what I like to call the three-day formation of Grand Canyon. Now, I've gotten this information by going to a host of creation-believing scientists. I don't make this stuff up myself. And I want you to know that someone told me once, if you take everything from one person, that's plagiarism. If you take it from a lot of people, that's research. So, <laughs> so I put in years of research on this. I want you to realize that. Now, we're taught a couple of things about Grand Canyon. So there are two things we need to look at. We're told that the strata through which the canyon cuts those strata layers formed over hundreds of millions of years of death and suffering. And then we're told that the Grand Canyon formed over millions of additional years of time. 
Now these are based on a process known as uniformitarianism. This is a key concept for millions of years belief. Basically, the processes that we see occurring today have basically always been the same. So they can see strata forming at one inch per hundred years and say, wow, it took hundreds of millions of years for these strata to form, assuming it's always been the same. They look at the amount of silt being taken out by the Colorado River and they assume it's always been the same, uniformitarianism. And they say it took hundreds of millions of years for the canyon to form. In fact, this is prophesied in 2 Peter that there will come in the last days scoffers saying that all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Uniformity. Scoffers are going to claim this. The Bible, as always, hits the nail right on the head. Let me show you what a faulty theory uniformity is. Have you ever seen the, the oil drain from a car? Well, you pull out the plug and boosh, oil pours into the pan below very quickly. Now, if you came along 24 hours later, you might see one drop every two days. Now, if your thought process was based on uniformity, you could look at the amount of oil in the pan, one drop every two days, and say, wow, it took millions of years to fill that pan with oil. <laughs> but you'd be absolutely wrong. It happened very quickly. Present processes are not the same as they've always been. This world was judged with a global flood. In fact, 2 Peter goes on and says, these scoffers will be willingly ignorant. They will choose to ignore that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. As when I was a theistic evolutionist or progressive creationist, what did they say about the global flood? Oh, it wasn't a global flood, it was a local flood. They don't even realize they're doing this. Don't get me wrong, I'm not attacking those people, I'm trying to help them. They are denying the word of God to fit millions of years into the Bible. Because anyone's belief in the age of the earth comes down to how those sedimentary layers of rock formed quickly in a global flood or slowly over billions of years of death and suffering. All old earth beliefs come from a belief that there was not a global flood. But your belief in the age of the earth comes down to whether or not there was a global flood. Now people can grow up and become policemen and plumbers and firemen and some people become scientists. But people all have religious beliefs. Even an atheist has a religious belief. It's atheism. But whatever that scientist's religious belief is will bias how they interpret existing evidence. You see, the study of the earth has never been about the evidence. We all have the exact same evidence. Young earth, old earth believers, we have the same evidence to study. It's about the philosophical framework through which you interpret that evidence. You see, if you look at the strata through a biblical worldview, you say sedimentary layers laid down by water, global flood. If you look at it through an evolutionary or billions of years worldview, you say, wow, slow formation over billions of years of death and suffering. Same evidence. So let's take a look at Grand Canyon strata formation. <clears throat> because there are many evidences at Grand Canyon that the strata were laid down quickly and by water. Well, evolutionists claim that sponge and coral reefs found in the red wall limestone uh, stone prove it formed over millions of years. Now, the red wall is about a third of the way down the canyon, and it's about 900 feet thick. And evolutionists say it formed in, in calm, tranquil oceans. And they say that the sponge and coral reefs found in there prove this. And I've got to admit, sponge and coral reefs would have to prove they formed slowly, not in a global flood. However, this from the Colorado Geological Society. Researchers have concluded that coral reefs are not known in the red wall. Hmm. This from the uh, Grand Canyon geology. Sponge reefs have not been documented. They're claiming that sponge and coral reefs prove the red wall formed over millions of years. They leave one slight little fact out. <laughs> sponge and coral reefs have never been found in the red wall. Mind-boggling dishonesty. A layer about seven feet thick has been found through the bottom third of the red wall. It, it extends from the western edge of Las Vegas all the way through to the eastern edge of the Painted Desert. It covers tens of thousands of square miles. There's an estimated one billion of these creatures called nautiloids laid down in it. They're a squid-like creature with a conical shell shaped something like a cigar, and they can be from two inches to a few feet long. And they're pretty much all oriented facing the same direction, which means that they were laid down and running mud and water very quickly, not in calm, tranquil seas over millions of years of time. 
In fact, cross-bedded sand dunes are found in many of the layers of Grand Canyon, including the Red Wall. Well, evolutionists claim these are desert dunes that formed slowly over millions of years of time. However, the angle of inclination of those dunes is too steep to have formed in deserts. They had to have formed underwater. Have you, you ever gone to the beach and you make a sand castle? You get a bucket of moist sand, right? Flip it upside down, pull the bucket off, and it holds that steep slope, correct? Well, what would happen if you did that with dry sand? Pull the bucket off, <laughs> right? You would lose the slope. The angle of inclination, the slope of those sand dunes prove they formed underwater. In fact, many of those dunes have erosion marks called lines of parting lineation, which are only found in dunes that form underwater. They're never found in desert dunes. All the layers of Grand Canyon contain marine fossils, starfish, jellyfish, etc. They might have a chunk of sponge or a, a chunk of coral that was torn up in the flood, but not reefs. So all the layers were formed in water. Microscopic spheres of polonium form radio halos. Now keep in mind, these are microscopic in size, but when polonium first forms, it gives off a burst of energy, like a, well, an, an, anim, an animal's to a, a firework going off in the sky. You've seen a big firework goes off and that burst of energy dissipates away pretty quickly. Well, when the polonium forms and polonium-210 halos, that energy would last for about a little less than two years. But when it first forms, it gives off this burst, and if it's caught in a rock that hardens or a log that petrifies within that two-year period, it'll capture the burst of energy. So it makes a sphere, and when cut in half, it has these rings, and they call them radio halos. Well, these have been found in petrified logs on the Colorado Plateau. Now, some have been found that were squished while they were forming. They know this because the upper right picture, you see the elongated dark shape? It was forming the sphere, and something squished the entire strata layer. They know it was within a two-year period of time because it started forming the round sphere once again after the squishing event took place. Well, the interesting thing is that these types of halos have been found in three different strata layers on the Colorado Plateau. The Jurassic, Eocene, and Triassic, which geology is teaching formed over a quarter of a billion years. This proves they all formed in less than two years like during the global flood, perhaps. There are a lack of time gaps between the strata layers of Grand Canyon. If a layer laid there and the top of it was exposed to the elements for millions of years before the next layer came along, well, you should find time gaps, erosion marks, wind erosion, rain erosion, plants growing into the top layers, etc. There's a lack of time gaps proving the layers laid down on top of each other very quickly, like during that global flood. In fact, absolute proof of massive sheet-fed flooding is found at Grand Canyon. And uh, we do bus tours for groups to Grand Canyon, and I'll tell you, these two buttes are two of the, probably the best physical evidences in the world of the truth of God's Word. Cedar Butte and Red Butte stand above the rim of the canyon. They are 900 feet tall of sedimentary layers laid down by water, but they're gone for thousands of square miles in all directions, other than these buttes. So if you've ever been to Grand Canyon, when you stand at the edge of that canyon, there used to be 900 feet of strata above you, all across the plateau, and those layers are gone, with no evidence as to where they went. You see, when the floodwaters were coming and going, they were laying down layers and picking them up, and laying them down and picking them up, and the last time they ran off, Cedar Butte and Red Butte were the last pieces clinging when the waters ran away. In fact, this is Cedar Butte. If you were standing right here at the edge of the canyon, right behind you would be Cedar Butte, 900 feet towering above you, gone for thousands of square miles. We did a bus tour last summer, and a Mormon family went along with us. And at the end of the day, the man came up to me. He said, Russ, I saw the truth of Scripture at Grand Canyon today at Cedar Butte. He asked me for a good church to go to, and two months later, his whole family was baptized as Christians because of Cedar Butte. Uh, it's just amazing, proof of God's word. Oh, this is Red Butte. If you leave uh, the canyon heading south through Tucson, five miles south and a mile to the east of the road, you have to drive right by Red Butte, 900 feet of strata. My best friend, since I've been 11 years old, um, didn't talk to me for four years after I started this ministry. because He's a scientist. He's an evolution of millions of years. He hadn't gone to church since he left high school. 
And then one day, about two years ago, we were driving north out of Williams, early in the morning, came up over a rise, and 40 miles in the distance, across this sloping plain, there was Red Butte. Standing up like a sore thumb, I said, it's Doug, Red Butte, 900 feet of strata, laid down by water, gone for thousands of square miles in all directions. Proof of the global flood and the young earth. Silence for 10 minutes. And then he said, if there was a global flood, where did all the water go? I said, well, Doug, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, and there's a massive tectonic event at the end of the flood, smashed plates together and formed the ocean basins. The water's in the ocean basin. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. He didn't talk about it anymore. Two weeks later, he went to church and gave his life back to Jesus. Cedar and Red Buttes, two of the most awesome proofs that we can trust God's word, word for word and cover to cover. And people go to the Grand Canyon and they will look down in the Grand Canyon and say, well, let's find the proof of God's word. They're looking the wrong way. Turn around and look behind you at Cedar and Red Butte. Let's go up to Mount St. Helens and look at some evidence from there. God gave scientists a living laboratory up there. We're told that he looks on the earth and it trembles. God touched the hills and they smoke. Well, in May of 1980, God reached down and he touched Mount St. Helens and it trembled and it smoked. It erupted with the force of a World War II atomic bomb blast, one per second, 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour for nine straight hours. Power beyond our comprehension, and this was a small volcano. Millions of tons of ash were tossed up into the atmosphere. Now, the textbooks teach kids that strata form slowly over millions of years. Who's ever seen strata form over millions of years? Okay, that's a belief, right? Now, if I can show you one example of strata forming quickly, we've shown that that belief shouldn't be taught as a fact, right? Well, at um, Mount St. Helens, the atmospheric discharge, uh, running water, mud flows, they all formed various strata layers. Up to 600 feet of finely stratified layers were all formed by various methods in a matter of minutes or hours. Oh, and those layers that were laid down 27 years ago with plant and animal materials buried in them, They've already petrified and turned to rock. Well, I thought it took millions of years for those things to take place. See, I think we are getting close to the end, and God is giving us proofs. We will be without excuse. You can visit uh, Yellowstone National Park and go to Specimen Ridge, and you're going to be shown a hill that has 26 strata layers with polystrata, fossilized trees, coming out of each layer. And the story you're going to be told, in fact, I saw a pastor, an ex-pastor seven years ago that went to Specimen Ridge, lost his faith, and is now an outspoken atheist. Well, what they tell you is that a forest grew, over millions of years, and a catastrophic event wiped out the forest. And then over millions of years, another forest grew, and then a catastrophic event wiped out the forest. And on and on this goes for 26 layers representing supposedly hundreds of millions of years of death and suffering before man. But thanks in large part to Mount St. Helens, we know now that during the flood, massive amounts of vegetation were uprooted and floated on the surface. Trees would have floated in the horizontal position until they waterlogged to the point that they turned and floated in the upright position. Let's see if I can do this with this bottle of water without spilling it. But they would have floated in a horizontal position until they waterlogged to the point the heavier side, usually the root, would turn and float in the upright position until it waterlogged to the point it sank to the bottom, floating against the bottom in an upright position while the floodwaters were laying down strata layers burying them in different looking layers as if they had grown at different times. Proof of the global flood, not proof for millions of years. In fact, Spirit Lake, just north of Mount St. Helens, was filled with blown down trees by the explosion. And today there are an estimated 50,000 polystrata trees at the bottom of Spirit Lake. There I am at Spirit Lake right there. There's an upright floating log right next to me, right there. Oh, excuse me. Right there. (laughs) 
The Bible tells us, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, so that they, they that don't believe in the biblical accounts of creation and in our true Lord and Savior, will be without excuse. Without excuse. And we don't want to have anyone in that position. And Grand Canyon strata are a testament to the global flood judgment. Okay, so the strata were laid down quickly via a global flood, but how did Grand Canyon form? Well, the textbooks tell us that the canyon was dug out by the Colorado River over millions of years of time. Who's ever seen that happen over millions of years of time? Nobody. Here's a satellite photo of Grand Canyon. The white is snow. It's on the Kaibab upwork. The upwork uplifts the surrounding area about 3,500 feet above the plain. And the canyon cuts through that upwork. That's what makes it so spectacular. However, where the water enters the, can the, the canyon, it's only a mile below the top of the rim. Well, water doesn't flow uphill, does it? So they had to come up with some excuses to explain how the river could have possibly dug out Grand Canyon. So they came up with the ancient river, or the antecedent river theory, which basically says, well, maybe the Colorado River eroded the chasm, think about this, at the exact same rate the upwarp was eroding. The upwarp was lifting and the water was eroding at the same pace. Well, talk about a miracle. There's actually many fatal flaws with this. Okay, for instance, no one has ever found the supposed ancestral riverbed of the supposed ancestral Colorado River. It, it was never there. It didn't exist. And also, you can scientifically refute this because the upwarp formed, and at the north end, there are horizontal Wasatch layers laid down against the already formed upwarp. Otherwise, they would have been uplifted as well. And the event that eroded the canyon goes through both the horizontal layers and the upwarp. There's no way the upwarp formed at the same time the river was eroding the canyon. In fact, a symposium of geologists reviewed the ancient river theory and unanimously rejected it. But don't expect that to get it out of textbooks anytime soon. The symposium took place in 1964. Oh, they've known for 50 years the ancient river theory doesn't, doesn't fly. So they try to come up with another theory because they don't want to admit, well, it formed as a, you know, rapidly because that would support God's word. So they came up with what they call the precocious gully or the uh, stream capture theory, which basically says, well, maybe a gully managed to erode the Grand Canyon in, in maybe just five million years of time. Well, the problems with this are really astronomical. For instance, there's a notorious lack of Colorado River sediments in the west and a similar lack in the east. There are 908 cubic miles of missing sediments from Grand Canyon. They're not along the edge of the Colorado River. They're not in the Gulf of California. They got dispersed very quickly. Scientists think there might be some in San Diego County. There might be some outside of Phoenix, but they got dispersed so widely, we're not sure where they are. And you gotta ask yourself this. I mean, stand on the edge of Grand Canyon, just common sense. A gully did this? <laughs> I've got a gully in my front yard in Flagstaff. I'm gonna fill it up with cement when I get home if my house is still there. I hope my dog's okay. So how did Grand Canyon form? Well, let's go back to Mount St. Helens where God showed scientists how the canyon did form quickly. At the start of the eruption, the north side of the mountain slid off into the Toodle Valley below, damming up the Toodle River. Over a two-year period, a huge lake formed behind that earthen dam. And then in March of 1982, the waters breached the dam. Now, when water breaches a dam, it drains it catastrophically by, by a massive water and mud flow and forms several complete canyons, side canyons and all, in just a matter of hours. In fact, here are two men standing by a canyon at, at uh, Mount St. Helens that formed in a matter of minutes by rapid water and mud flow. It's called the Little Grand Canyon. Well, I thought structures like this formed slowly over millions of years. We've seen them happen quickly. We've never seen them happen over millions of years. This canyon was formed at Mount St. Helens in just a matter of hours by massive water and mud flow. It's over 1,000 feet wide, 160 feet deep, and over two miles long. Now, if you didn't know about the eruption and how this canyon formed, and you went there today, a stream has entered the already formed canyon. And you could measure the amount of silt being taken out by the stream, and using uniformity as your basis of knowledge, you could say it took millions of years for the stream to form this canyon, 
But you'd be absolutely wrong, wouldn't you? It formed very quickly, not slowly. So let's go back to Grand Canyon, and let's take a look at what we call the breach dam theory of the canyon. The elevations really tell us the tale. The Kaibab Upwarp was a giant dam, an earthen dam, until the waters breached the dam. The Bible indicates that toward the end of the flood, they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. The mountains arose and the valley sank down during the flood. There was a massive tectonic event that smashed plates to, together around the globe. The textbooks correctly teach that you can't bend rock. If I had a piece of shale that was a foot thick and an inch, inch thick and a foot wide and let's say 10 feet long and I stood on one side and it went off the podium and, and these two gentlemen stood on the other, would it slowly bend down to the ground? It would snap, wouldn't it? You can't bend rock like that. Do you think you could take rock and bend it at a 90 degree angle? What about at a 160 degree angle without breaking it? No, you couldn't do that, could you? Yeah, we find geologic compression events around the globe where entire mountain ranges are squished together like an accordion with 160 degree bends in the rock. Rock's not broken. You see, those are still moist sediments that have just been laid down by the flood. And when this massive tectonic event smashed them together, they just squished up. They've hardened into rock since. Proof of the global flood. And you can find these all over the world. In fact, the Kaibab up Upwarp is a great example. It flexes the plateau about 3,500 feet around the surrounding plains. Yet if you cut into the upwarp, you'll find that the layers are bent, they're uplifted, but they're not broken because there are still moist sediment layers toward the end of the flood. In fact, if the canyon didn't cut through the upwarp today, the trap lakes behind the upwarp would hold three times the amount of water held by Lake Michigan today. It's a huge lake. Lake evidences include the thin mud and silt lamini, freshwater uh, fish fossils and beavers found 6,000 feet elevation, relic landforms like Bryce Canyon. If you've ever been to Bryce Canyon, the, the formations are off the edge of a mesa on the side of it. That was the edge of the lake. When it suddenly drained, it left those formations behind. Look at Bryce. There's no way they could have formed slowly. You ever walk along the edge of a river and, and you notice where the edges drop straight off like these bowl-shaped canyons at Grand Canyon? Those are called sapping structures. The water got underneath the layers and caused them to drop straight in. They're not V-shaped as if they had formed slowly in any way, shape, or form. When water tunnels through a dam, it causes the dam to collapse and drain catastrophically via massive water and mud flow. Massive water flow leads to many destructive forces, like plucking, which is the hydraulic lifting of large slabs of rock, which are then torn up by the 100 to 120 mile moving waters, and they tumble through the canyon, helping erode the canyon. Cavitation bubbles imploded up to almost a half a million pounds per square inch, pulverizing rock instantaneously, and now this grit and sand is rushing through the waters, and this is all digging out the canyons very quickly. This is a spillway inside of Glen Canyon Dam above Grand Canyon, below Lake Powell. Back in 1983, we had a lot of snow, and during the spring runoff, the lake was filling up very quickly, and then they had some heavy spring rains, and the runoff was threatening to overflow and collapse the dam. They opened up all the spillways, and the dam started to shake. They looked out underneath the dam, and one of the, one of the spillways, the water coming out had turned red. They closed down that spillway and went inside to see what had taken place. Well, a cavitation event had taken place that ate through the three-foot steel-reinforced concrete and 25 feet into the bedrock below in a matter of minutes. If they had not closed down that spillway, the entire dam would have collapsed. The Grand Canyon would be a bit larger today. Now, this is Grand Coulee in the state of Washington. This canyon is 50 miles long, up to 6 miles wide, and 900 feet deep. It was eroded through solid rock by a massive dam breach. Back in the 1920s, geology was teaching that the scab lands in eastern Washington formed over hundreds of millions of years. And then one brave geologist in the 1920s, a Dr. Bretz, said, wait a minute, I think the scab lands formed in a matter of days by a massive dam breach. He was ridiculed, scorned, and pretty much had his career destroyed. Forty-five years later, in the mid-1960s, geology finally admitted the scab lands formed very quickly by a massive dam breach. 
Grand Canyon is the exact same story. Marble Canyon opens abruptly to form the canyon where the Kaibab upwarp was breached. This textbook asks the kids, kids, challenge your thinking. Grand Canyon shows wide meandering loops of a slow-moving river, but the steep canyon walls of a, of a youthful, fast-moving river. How might this conflict be explained? Well, very easily. The Kaibab Upwork was a huge earthen dam and captured lake waters behind it from the Colorado Plateau runoff until the waters breached the dam and the water came cascading through, carving out the steep canyon walls. And then the Colorado River entered the already formed canyon and carved out the meandering loops over the past couple of thousand years. See, it fits the biblical worldview perfectly. The old earth folks, they have a difficult time figuring this out. Even the uh, Native Americans that live at the bottom of the canyon, they have a legend of how the canyon formed following a massive water event, aquatic water event, a flood. Results of modern dam failures, the steep canyon sides, historical accounts, huge boulders weighing tens of thousands of pounds found in the sandstones that had to be moved there by massive water flow. Lake evidences and more all support the breach dam theory. All support the breach dam theory. Sometimes I'm asked, and sometimes by scoffers, and, and sometimes by, by well-meaning people as well, well, come on, Russ, if Genesis is true about the global flood, why don't we find hundreds of Grand Canyons around the world? Well, that's a fair question. Let me ask another question, and then I'll answer both. If rivers carve out huge canyons over millions of years, and if the Earth is billions of years old, then why don't we have millions of Grand Canyons around the world? I mean, every gully should be a Grand Canyon by now, right? Well, the reason is simple. It took a very special set of circumstances to form Grand Canyon. At the end of the global flood, the mountains arose and the valley sank down with a massive tectonic event that smashed plates together, forming mountain ranges and ocean basins and forming the Kaibab Upwork, which acted as a huge earthen dam catching the runoff from the Colorado Plateau, perhaps for as much as 1,000 or 2,000 years after the flood. But eventually, those lake waters broke through the dam and caused it to collapse catastrophically by a massive water and mud flow, dispersing the sediments to where they're difficult for scientists to identify even today. The Grand Canyon is awesome proof of God's word being true. And unless you think it's just me, a young earth-believing Christian, well, even National Geographic for Kids, a proselytizer of millions of years in evolution, came out with this article saying, well, uh, research has turned the old earth theories upside down. Geologists now think the Grand Canyon grew in quick spurts from massive flooding. Well, they, they've gone from no floods over hundreds of millions of years to lots of floods in less than a million years. There was one flood, and this was a direct result following the flood. And eventually, I think the truth is going to come out. Yet next week, millions of kids are going to be told that over millions of years of death and suffering, the Colorado River dug out Grand Canyon. But you can tell a six-year-old anything, and they're going to believe you, as they should be able to. So why continue to deny the global flood? Well, because a global flood destroys every old earth belief. How important is the global flood to the Christian faith? Let me repeat that. A global flood destroys every old earth belief, from Eastern religions to progressive creation to atheistic evolution to theistic evolution. If we would just stand firm for the word of God, the church would be so much stronger. And it's because they're teaching now in the fourth generation that it's a fact that life has evolved on earth and the magic ingredient is an immense length of time. They have to have millions and billions of years or their theories are dead in the water. American Atheist Magazine said, destroy original sin. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution and millions of years beliefs mean, then Christianity is nothing. And I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. That's the reason we don't need to compromise God's word. We can stand firm for God's word. He has given us overwhelming evidence that his word is true. He says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. He wants us to look at the evidence. Because otherwise he knows we're going to be misled by these humanistic teachings. No wonder we're told to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. 
And my friends, there really are only two viable philosophies. Either God created the world in a six-day creation and judged that world with a global flood, just like he says he did, or the world evolved over millions of years of death and suffering, like the humanist test books are saying. I live in Flagstaff. It's a college town. We do have that group up there that says, well, maybe we're not here at all. Maybe we just think we're here. <laughs> As a general rule, I don't really listen to their philosophy. I, I mean, we really are here, so I try to look at the viable options. The fact is that the Bible is a looking glass through which people can correctly view the world. The Bible is not a science book. But where it crosses over with things that can be tested and studied scientifically, it always holds up. Why does it always hold up? Well, because it's true. Word for word and cover to cover. But how the biblical accounts stand up to observable facts, or how we are told they stand up to false observable facts, non-observable facts, I should say, will influence whether or not people put their trust in God's moral and spiritual messages as well. And this is why we're losing so many kids. Studies now say four out of five Christian kids will leave the faith once they leave the house. 80%. Well, that number's been going up for the last 20 years. It went from 60 to 65 to 70. Now it's up to 80, as high as 80%. Why? Because we can teach the kids the Bible. And they can understand the Bible, and they can memorize the Bible. And they need to. Don't get me wrong. But the problem is that they go to school, and, and what they're being taught is, hey, look, we know you know the Bible. The problem is the Bible's not true. And they're being taught we evolved over millions of years. And even though they know the Bible, they're rejecting it. And we as Christians need to start standing up, and we better do it fast, because studies say in 30 years only 15% of Americans will be attending church because we're losing so many of our kids. In Britain, that number is going to be less than 1%. We need to be standing up and teaching that the Bible is true. The Bible says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. This is the calling of this ministry. We teach about the creation, evolution, age of the earth issues. We expose and refute false anti-biblical teachings. And we're providing a reason for the hope that's in the heart of every true believer and every true seeker. I did our 50 Facts versus Evolution at NAU in Klein Auditorium, it's Northern Arizona University, uh, last November, and none of the uh, campus ministers would let their kids go to it. <laughs> it was on the front page of the NAU newspaper for the next three weeks. We breached the dam. It was ready to walk through. But they did, I was told, well, that's unloving to tell the professors they're not right. But it's okay to let our kids be misled. But Grand Canyon is a monument to the authority of God's inspired word, word for word, and cover to cover. Why is that important? Well, because in John, we're told that in the beginning was the word, and all things were made by him. The word is our creator. We're also told that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word, our creator, is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word. But Jesus also called himself the bread of life. So Jesus is the word, and Jesus is the bread of life. But when tempted by Satan, Jesus answered Satan and said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. And my friends, that means word for word and cover to cover, including the first five words of Scripture given to us by Moses, which are that in the beginning, God created. We can believe those words and every word thereafter. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every dear soul that's here today. Hope and I pray that this information will be a blessing to them. I thank you for your beloved Son who came and died on a cross so our sins may be forgiven if we just put our faith in him. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.